Good morning. Ah, you made it just in time, Antonia. The following Zoom session is being recorded and will appear later today on my YouTube channel, Math with Mail. Therefore, if you participate in the Zoom meeting, if you do not wish for your picture or name to be made public, please leave the video off and use an alias name. If you have questions during the meeting but do not wish to speak, email me at bmail.ybcc.edu and I'll respond as soon as I can. All right, good morning. So, Antonia, do you have questions, specific questions you'd like to look at? Yes, I do. Okay. And I got a bunch of requests from uh, a lot of stuff from Chapter 11, but do you have anything in Chapter 9 you want to look at? Chapter 9, I do have some. Okay, give me just a second here. All right, let's see here. <clears throat> Chapter nine. Are these questions from the review or the test or what? Test. Yes. Okay. So, chapter nine test. Let me get it up here. Okay. Chapter nine. All right, let's switch the screen. Okay, what do you got? This is chapter nine test, yours. Oh, one one was number two, number question two? number two. Okay, so what's going on here is you've got a negative number mm -hmm. taking an even root. You can't take an even root of a negative number. So the answer is that it's not real. Got it. I thought so. Okay. What else? Okay. Question number eight. Okay. Number eight. Simplify the radical expression. All variables represent positive real numbers. So we're taking the cube root of 513x to the 12th, y to the fourth. So 513 is three times. Well, let's see. If we take 513 divided by three, we get 171. If we take 171 divided by three, we get 57. If we take 57 divided by three, we get 19. And 19 is prime. So I could write this as three cubed times 19, okay? Now, since our index is a three, we want powers that are threes or multiples of three and then leftovers. So what I'm going to do, 513 is going to be 3 cubed times 19. x to the 12th, 12 is, 12 is a multiple of 3, so x to the 12th. y to the 4th, I'm going to write as y cubed times y to the 1 power. So everything is, uh, the exponents are 3s or multiples of 3 and then leftovers. So far, so good? Yes. All right. The cube root of three cubed is three on the outside. The 19 is stuck inside. The cube root of x to the 12th is x to the fourth. The cube root of y cubed is y, and the single y is left inside. So inside I have the cube root of 19 y, and there is the final answer. All righty. Yes. What's next? Next is um, <clears throat> number 10, I believe. So that was having issues on that one. Right here, this one? Yes, yes. Okay. Number 10. 1 16th 
x to the eighth, y to the fourth, the whole thing to the three fourths power. Simplify the expression. All variables represent positive real numbers, so we don't need to worry about absolute value bars. Okay. So I've got one to the three fourths power over 16 to the three fourths power times x to the eighth to the three fourths power times y to the fourth to the three fourths power. So each of the factors inside the parentheses get raised to the three fourths power. Okay, now we're going to deal with each one individually. One to the three fourths power, well, one cubed is one, and then to the one fourth power is going to be one. So this is one. 16 to the 3 fourths power is, I could take the fourth root of 16 and then cube it. The fourth root of 16 is 2. 2 cubed is 8. OK, so far? Yes. x to the 8th to the 3 fourths power. A power raised to a power, you'd multiply the exponents. 8 times 3 fourths is 24 fourths, or 6. So this is x to the sixth. And then here, y to the fourth to the three fourths power. Again, a power raised to a power, you multiply the exponent. So this is y cubed. So your final answer, one eighth x to the sixth y cubed. Which you could also write like this. Oops. So x to the sixth, y cubed over eight. All righty, what's next? Uh, number 13. Okay. Simplify the expression, the variable represents a positive real number. So again, we don't need to worry about absolute value bars. n to the one fifth power times the quantity n to the two fifths power minus n to the negative one fifth power. So we're going to distribute, ah. And the answer that you've got, can you see the answer you wrote there? Yeah. It's correct and I gave you credit for it. What the, the authors wanted was they wanted it written at, at an exponential form. So they, instead of having the fifth root, they want it written this way, they wanted it written that way. Oh, got it, yeah. But, okay. but there's, no, there's nothing wrong with what you did. They didn't really specify which form to put it in. So uh, again, I'll go ahead and do it. But so this yeah. is gonna be n to the one fifth times n to the two fifths minus n to the one fifth times n to the negative one fifth. This is n to the three fifths minus n to the zero, which is n to the three fifths minus one. And that's the same thing as the fifth root of n cubed minus one. What would have been great is if they'd said, you know, write your answer in exponential form or something like that, but they did. So anyway. There's that. All righty? Yes, that makes sense. Sure. What else? <clears throat> the other one I have was having um, number 14. Okay. So 14 is basically the same thing. Okay. We've got but, what? The, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, but do you want me to do it? Yeah, please. Okay, okay, no problem. Uh, we got that times this. So again, we're going to distribute. So we'll get t to the six fifth power times t to the four fifths plus t to the six fifths power times t to the negative six fifth power. So this would be t to the ten fifths or t squared plus. And this would be t to the zero power or one. So t squared plus one, final answer.
Um, number 16 on the okay. same one. Simplify the expression, the Q root of 72. All right. So 72 is nine times eight, which is three times three times two times two times two, or three squared times two cubed. So breaking it down into its prime factorization. Well, the cube root of a square, that's not going anywhere, but the cube root of two cubed is two outside. So we get two cube roots of three squared, which is nine. Will you be able to go over number 18? Just I sure you... will. Thank you. Okay. Number 18, find the domain of the function g of x equals the square root of x plus 13. Since we're taking a square root or more generally an even root, the radicand, the quantity inside the radical can't be negative. So that means that this has to be either positive or equal to zero, okay? Now solving this inequality, we get x is greater than or equal to negative 13, but writing that in interval notation, you would have everything from negative 13 up to infinity. Okay, then other one I had a question is number 20. Okay. Number 20, multiply and simplify if possible. The square root of two plus three times the square root of two minus nine. So basically it's like foiling together two binomials. We have the square root of two times the square root of two minus the square root of two times nine plus three times the square root of two minus three times nine. So we've got those four products. Okay with where I got all of those? Yes. The square root of two times the square root of two is two. And then we get minus nine square roots of two plus three square roots of two minus 27. Two minus 27 is negative 25. And combining like radicals, minus nine square roots of two plus three square roots of two would be minus six square roots of two. So there's your final answer. So you'd choose this one. Oh, okay. I know where I get it wrong. Um, I was practicing yesterday and I got something wrong. I wouldn't, I wouldn't get my answer. Okay. Yeah. And the other one would be number 25. Okay. Absolute value. No, not absolute value. Uh, oh, solve the equation. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I was thinking it was absolute value. Number 25. So let f of x equal the square root of 2x squared minus 7x. For what values of x is f of x equal to 2? Well, if f of x equals 2, you would have the following. Okay, because we're going to replace f of x 
with two. Uh -huh. So now we have a radical equation with one radical and it's already by itself. So the next move is gonna be to square both sides of the equation. On the left side, we get four. On the right side, we get two X squared minus seven X. Since this is a second degree equation, I'm gonna set it equal to zero. Like that. Now to solve this, at this point, let's see, this is chapter nine. So we haven't actually introduced the quadratic formula at this point. Mm -hmm. So we'll factor it and factoring it, A is two, B is negative seven, C is negative four, the product is negative eight, the sum is negative seven, the numbers are negative eight and one. So we get zero equals two X squared minus eight X, plus x minus four. Factoring by grouping, I'm gonna bring, come down here, we get zero equals, let's see here, uh, we'll take out a two x and have an x minus four left over, plus one times x minus four, which then gives us x minus four times two x plus one equals zero. I'm uh, moving all over the place here. I'm going to take this and go up over here. So x minus 4 equals 0 or 2x plus 1 equals 0. If x minus 4 equals 0, x equals 4. If 2x plus 1 equals 0, 2x equals negative 1 and x equals negative 1 half. So there are your two solutions. Now, um, what we should do is we should check the results because we squared both sides of the equa equation. So let's go back here before we squared both sides. I'm going to go to the next page. So hang on a minute. Let's see. 2 equals the square root of 2x squared minus 7x. And I got x equals negative a half, x equals 4. Okay. So Again, I'm taking the proposed solutions and plugging them into the original equation before I squared both sides. If X is negative one half, let's see, negative one half squared minus seven times negative one half. This is two times, negative a half times negative a half would be positive a fourth. And then minus seven times minus a half would be plus seven halves. Two times a fourth would be one half. So we get one half plus seven halves, which is eight halves, square root that is, which is the square root of four. So two equals two. So basically all that shows that that one checks, okay? Okay. Now I'm gonna go back and check that X equals four. So we get, what, 2 times 16 minus 28, 32 minus 28, 4, square root of 4 is 2, 2 equals 2. So they both check. Because recall, whenever you square both sides or, or raise both sides to the same power, you always want to check your solutions so that you don't get extraneous solutions, ones that show up, but they don't work. In this case, they both worked. Okay, got it. All right. Oh, that's it for chapter nine. So on to chapter 10. I do have um, questions on chapter 10. Right. But you're done with nine? Yes, I am. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Hang on. Let me switch things up here. So chapter 10. And again, the chapter 10 test, right? 
Yes. All righty. And for chapter 10, I have uh, question number five. Okay. okay. Solve the equation, approximate the solutions to two decimal places. All right. T squared equals T plus eight. I'm looking at your answers here, and this is one of the things that bothers me about WebAssign. So technically, the answer in the box here is what you should have written. Now, what you've got that you entered was the correct exact answer, but they asked for the approximate solution. So, so if, like if this had been in class, you would have got dinged for this because like, well, you didn't follow the directions. I'm not trying to pick on you, just saying they wanted decimal <laughs> answers, but. Again, oh, yeah, you're right. <laughs> yeah, but they mark it right. So I'm like, okay, fine. But just, just telling you. Okay. Oh, okay, I got it. Yeah, you're right. It yeah. was just... It's okay. It's all right. There's a lot of situations like that. All right. So first thing we're going to do is put this in standard form. So T squared minus T minus 8 equals 0. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use the quadratic formula. A is 1 b is negative 1, c is negative 8. So t equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. t equals 1 plus or minus the square root of 1 plus 32 all over two. T equals one plus or minus the square root of 33 all over two. So the exact answers, T equals one plus the square root of 33 all over two. T equals one minus the square root of 33 all over two. But now to get the decimal approximations, we would have, we would put parentheses around the whole thing as well as the radical so that you're dividing the whole thing by two. So on the calculator, parentheses, one plus the square root of 33, close up the radical with a right parenthesis, close up the entire numerator with a second right parenthesis, divided by two, and I get 3.372, so to two decimal places, 3.37. And then doing the minus, you would get negative 2.372. So again, negative 2.37. And there you have it. So these are the exact solutions. These are the decimal approximations. Okay, and uh, number six. Alrighty. Use the quadratic formula to solve the equation. X squared over 12 minus X over six equals one half. So I've got an equation with fractions. I think the best move would be to clear the fractions by multiplying both sides by the LCD, which is 12. So 12 times x squared over 12 would be x squared minus 12x x over 6 would be 2x equals 1 half times 12, which is 6. So that's distributing the 12 and reducing everything to clear the fractions. You okay with that? Yes. All right. Then I'm going to subtract 6 from both sides. x squared minus 2x minus 6 equals 0. 
using the quadratic formula, a equals one, b equals negative two, c equals negative six, x equals negative b, plus or minus the square root of b squared minus four a c all over two a. x equals positive two, plus or minus the square root of four plus 24 all over two. X equals two plus or minus the square root of 28 all over two. But the square root of 28 is the square root of four times seven. Four is two squared, square root of two squared is two. So I get two square roots of seven. So that's gonna go and replace that. Okay, so far so good? Yes. But I could rewrite this like that, which would then reduce down to one plus or minus the square root of seven. Because this would reduce down to one and this would reduce down to one times the square root of seven or just the square root of seven. So X is one plus the square root of seven, X is one minus the square root of seven. And of course it says to write them separating by commas, which you did. And the thing you wanna be careful of here, notice how your comma is outside the radical, which is correct. Sometimes students won't move outside the radical and the comma will be inside. So it'll look something like this, uh, one plus the square root of seven comma, one minus the square root of seven. And WebAssign thinks that that comma is inside and so it marks it wrong. So you gotta be careful with the notation, but you did it correctly. Of course. And another one for that one would be number eight. Okay, number eight. Ah. Okay. Determine the vertex and the axis of symmetry of the graph of the function. F of X equals negative five times the quantity x plus three squared plus four. All right, so this function is in the form y equals a times x minus h squared plus k. If a is greater than zero, the parabola opens upwards. If a is less than zero, the parabola opens downwards, okay? It doesn't specifically ask for that, but in this case, a is negative five, so the parabola should open downwards, which it does, okay? The axis of symmetry is at x equals h. Now, in this case, h is negative three and k is four, right? So the axis of symmetry is gonna be at x equals negative three, and it is an equation so axis of symmetry, x equals negative three. If you just put negative three in there and don't write x equals, it's gonna mark it wrong because it is an equation of a vertical line. If we were graphing by hand, there'd be a dotted line going right down through the axis of symmetry, all right? The vertex is at h, k. So that's at negative three, four which again, you've got here, okay? Now, uh, sort of a review of how you graph in WebAssign. So you're graphing a parabola. So over here, I think it's this square has the, the parabolas. You click on it until it's blue, okay? Then you plot two points. First of all, you plot the vertex. So you go negative three, four, and you click on it there. And then you plot a second point and you're gonna use this function. So we've got the following, let's see here, x, y, we've got this point. I would use an x value that's either right to the right or to the left, looks like you use negative two. So f of negative two is negative five times negative two plus three, the quantity squared plus four, which is negative five times one squared plus four which is negative five times one plus four, which is negative five plus four, which is negative one. So back here, you'd, you'd 
uh, after you've clicked this, it's turned blue, you'd click on the vertex, negative three, four, and then you'd click on negative two, negative one, and the parabola should show up. All righty. But just a reminder, you have to click on the vertex first. If you do a different point and then the vertex, it would give you a parabola looking like this. So you got to do the vertex first. We good to go on that one? Yes. All righty. And the last one would be number 11. Number 11. Okay. Let's see here. All right. Uh, determine the coordinates of the vertex and the intercepts. All right. So this is using that second form. Hang on a second here. Uh, let's see, minus 12x minus 32, the form that's y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. And so the a is the same a. If a is greater than zero, it opens up. If a is less than zero, it opens down. a is negative six. So this thing's going to open downwards, okay? Again, they don't specifically ask that, but if that doesn't line up with what you get, you know something's wrong. Okay, um, the vertex, to find the vertex, we need to start with negative B over 2A. So X equals negative B over 2A. Let's see, let's do this. A is negative six, B is negative 12, and C is negative 32. So negative B would be negative, negative 12 over two times negative six, which is 12 over negative 12, which is negative one, okay? So the axis of symmetry is at x equals negative one. And again, they aren't asking for that, but that's the x value of the vertex, okay? So then we find f of negative one, which is negative six times negative one squared minus 12 times negative one minus 32, which is negative six times one plus 12 minus 32, negative six plus 12 minus 32. Oh, let's see, what is that? Uh, 26, negative 26? Um, let's see, I think so, negative 26. Hmm. Let me, let me double check that. Negative six plus 12 minus 32 is negative 26, yes. So the vertex is at negative one comma negative 26. Hmm. Hmm. You all right with that? Yes. Okay, now, x-intercepts. To find the x-intercepts, set y equal to zero. So I'm gonna take this and set y equal to zero. So I've got zero equals negative six x squared minus 12 x minus 32. I could factor a six out of that, negative six x squared plus two x plus, uh, oh no, I can't, six doesn't go into 32, my bad. My bad, hang, it just looked so nice. Well, I guess I can factor out a two, a negative two. So then I get three X squared plus six X plus 16, okay. Now, to solve this, we could factor it, or we could use the quadratic formula. What do you want to do? Factor. Factor, okay. So let's see here. Where am I going to go with this? I guess I'm going to end up going to the next page. I'm going to take this. Okay, so I could get rid of the negative two, right? So I just need to deal with that part. You okay with that? Yeah. 3x squared plus 6x. 3x squared plus 6x plus 16 equals zero. All right, so A is three, B is six, C is 16. The product is 
48 and the sum is six. How about, hmm, let's see here. They both gotta be positive? Hmm, hmm. Well, let's see, 48 and one, that would give me a sum of 49, 24 and two, that would give me a sum of 26, 12 and four, that would give me a sum of 16, six and eight, that would give me a sum of 14. So that's like having eight and six, but I'm trying to get to a six. Uh, let's see, uh, this would be a six and eight, it's not factorable. So that means that the factors are either imaginary or irrational. And I'm looking over here and it shows that it does not exist. Okay. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, okay, yeah. Okay, so now y-intercept, let's go back here. Your y-intercept would be zero comma negative 32 because when X is zero, that's zero, that's zero, and you've got negative 32. So, so yeah, your vertex negative one, negative 26, X intercept does not exist. So your graph, you'd actually have your vertex down here where this green dot is, mm -hmm. and then going down from there. Oh, okay. That makes sense. All righty. Anything else from chapter 10? No, again, that was it. For that chapter. All right, let's take a look at chapter 11. Give me again a minute here. And let's see here. And again, I assume you want the test? Yes. All righty. Okay. And number one. Start with number one. All right. Number one, let f of x equal 7x squared plus 4 and g of x equal 2x minus 3. Find the composition. So g composed with f of negative 2 would be equal to g of f of negative two, which is equal to g of, well, let's see, we need to find f of negative two. f of negative two is seven times negative two squared plus four, which is seven times four plus four, which is 28 plus four, which is 32, okay? So that goes in a substitution there. Now to find g of 32, that's gonna be g of 32 is two times 32 minus three, 64 minus three, which is 61. So final answer, 61. Okay, got it. All right, what next? Uh, number number eight. Number eight. Use a calculator to solve the equation. So you've got log of x equals 3.3711. Keep in mind, there's an implied 10 there, okay? So this is log base 10 of x equals 3.371. One, three, seven, one, yes, okay. I could rewrite this logarithmic equation as an exponential equation, and that would be 10 to the 3.3711 power 
equals x. So now on my calculator, 10 raised to the 3.3711 power, and I get 2350.173906, and it says to four decimal places, which would be to write here, and the zero would round down. So 2350.1739 would be the correct answer. And my last question would be number 15. Number 15, okay. All right, number 15. A wooden statue found in Egypt has a carbon-14 content that is three-fourths of that found in living wood. If the half-life of carbon-14 is 5,700 years, how old is the statue? Round your answer to the nearest 100 years. All right, this is a half-life problem. So we're gonna use the half-life formula. A equals A sub zero times two to the negative T divided by H power. We are told that the half-life is 5,700 years. And we're told that, uh, let's see, has a carbon content that is three-fifths of that found in living wood. Okay. So we're looking, time is the unknown. The beginning amount is A sub zero. The ending amount is three-fifths of the beginning amount, three-fifths A sub zero. And if you wanted to write that as a decimal, it would be what, 0 0.6, 60%, okay? So I need to find out how old it is, that's time. I know the half-life, the beginning amount is A sub zero and the ending amount is 60% of that or three-fifths of that. So now my formula becomes 0 0.6 A sub zero equals A sub zero times two to the negative t over 5,700 years. I'm going to divide both sides by a sub zero, giving me 0.6 equals two to the negative t over 5,700 years. Now I'll change it into a logarithmic equation, log base two of 0.6 equals negative t divided by 5,700. To solve for t, I'm gonna multiply both sides by negative 5,700. On the right side, the negative times the negative becomes positive and the 5,700 in the numerator reduces out with the 5,700 in the denominator. So t equals negative 5,700 log base two of 0.6. Using the change of base formula, t equals negative 5,700 log of 0.6 divided by log of two. And now it's calculator time. So negative, whoops, wrong one, negative 5,700 log of 0.6 divided by log of two and I get 4,200.703887. And it says round to the nearest 100 years. So that would be 4,200 years. All righty. All righty, got it. Okay. Um, Any other questions? No, not for me. All right. Um, I had some other requests that people emailed me that I'm going to go through. It, do you need to go because your, your lunch hour is over? Yes, I have to go. Okay, well, you go ahead and go, and I'm just going to keep going and answer other questions. And uh, later on, if you can always look at the video to see the other ones that I went through. Okay, thank you so much. You bet. Take care. You too.
Bye. Bye. Okay, so now I'm going to look at some things that people requested. Uh, give me a minute here to get this set up. We're going to start with section 11.2. inverse functions. Here, here we go. Okay. So this is from section 11.2. Number 16. The following function is one to one. Find the inverse of the function and express it using f inverse of x notation. So f of x equals 5x plus 9. Step number one, replace f of x with y. Step number two, interchange all of the x's with all of the y's. Step number three, solve the new equation for y. So I'm going to subtract nine and then divide by five. So y equals x minus nine over five. I'm going to switch that around just because I like to have y on the left. And then finally, inverse function notation. So f inverse of x equals x minus nine over five. And that should be the final answer. Okay, let's take a look at another one. Let's do number 19. Again, the following function is one to one. find the inverse of the function and express it using f inverse of x notation. Step number one, replace f of x with y. Step number two, interchange all the x's with all the y's. Step number three, solve for y. Well, y is in the denominator, so I need to get it in the numerator. So I'm going to multiply both sides by the quantity y minus 3. That will give me y minus 3 times x equals 2. All right. Now, the next the step is to get y by itself, and I've got a couple of options. Should I distribute first or not? Well. I'm not going to distribute first. This time I'm going to do this. I'm going to divide both sides by x. So I have y minus 3 equals 2 over x. Then I'm going to add 3 to both sides. So y equals 2 over x plus 3. And finally, using inverse function notation, f inverse of x equals 2 over x plus 3. So there you go. All righty. Uh, let's see, let's do one more. Let's do number 21. The following function is one to one. And again, find its inverse. So step number one, replace f of x with y. Step number two, interchange x and y. Step number three, solve for y. So I'll subtract 8 from both sides. I'm going to put the y's on the left. Now I'm going to take the cube root of both sides. So I get y equals the cube root of the quantity x minus 8. And finally, f inverse of x notation. So there's the inverse function. All right, let's see. 
Next topic that was requested is compound interest, compound growth, growth and doubling, compound growth. Yeah. All right. For that, we're going to go to, uh, let's see here, 11.5. And let's see, let me make sure I've got things correct. There's nobody here to tell me I've pushed the right buttons, but hopefully I have, let's see here. Um, Here we go, here we go, okay. So let's take a look at 31. And this is from 11.5. Assume that there are no deposits or withdrawals. An in initial investment of five of $8,000 earns 8.5% interest compounded continuously. What will the investment be worth in 14 years? Okay, so because it's compounded continuously, we're going to use A equals P times E to the RT power. That's for continuous compounding. And we know that P, the initial amount, is $8,000. And the annual interest rate is 8.5%, which is 0 0.085. And the time is 14 years. Round your answer to the nearest cent. So A equals $8,000 times E to the 0 0.085 times 14 power. So on my calculator, I get 8 thousand times e to the 0 0.085 times 14 power and I get 26296.64966. So rounding to the nearest cent, the nine is going to round up $26,296.65. Okay. Let's see here. All right. Um, let's see here. Let's compound it continuously. Got one where we're not compounding it continuously. These are all compounding continuously. You know what? I'm just going to make one up. Okay. So this, we're gonna call this made up. Uh, we're gonna invest, so we're gonna use this formula. We're going to invest $10,000 uh, at an annual interest rate of 5%, compounded quarterly, so four times a year for seven years, okay? So what makes this different from the previous problem? The previous problem, it said compounding continuously. This problem, which I couldn't find one here quickly enough, so just made one up. Here, it's being compounded four times a year. So we use this formula, not the A equals PE to the RT, okay? So A equals $10,000 times one plus, 0 0.05 over four to the four times seven power. So on my calculator, 10,000 parentheses, one plus 0 0.05 divided by four, close parentheses, caret, 
parentheses, four times seven, close parentheses. And I get 14159.92304. So the three would round down $14,159.92. All right, so there's uh, compound interest versus continuous growth interest. Now, let's see, uh, doubling. Take a look at number 41. How long will it take $7,000 to double if the investment at, an, if it is invested at an annual rate of 3% compounded continuously? Now, the formula for that is time equals the natural log of two over R, but it has to be compounded continuously for this to work. So the time would be the natural log of two divided by R, which is 3%. And let's see here, natural log of two divided by 0 0.03 is 23.1049060602. And let's say uh, rounded, oh, it says to one decimal place. So let's see here. It's gonna be, time is gonna be 23.1 years, okay? So again, doubling an investment that's compounded continuously. Okay, that. That. Let's take a look at some change of base and half-life stuff. So again, just a second. So give me a minute here. We want. 11.6. Okay. Eleven point six, we looked at the um, change of base formula. So let's take a look at number one. So this is eleven point six, number one log base eight of seven. Use the change of base formula to find the logarithm to four decimal places. So this would be log base 10 of seven over log base 10 of eight, or natural log of seven over natural log of eight, either one. You should get the same answer. I'm just gonna do the top one. So log of seven, close it up, divided by log of eight, close it up. And I get 0 0.93578. The eight would round up, so 0 0.9358. Okay, uh, let's do another one. Let's do number three. Number three, log base one eighth of nine. So that's the natural log of nine over the natural log of one eighth, or log base 10 of nine over log base 10 of 1 8th. This time I'm gonna use the natural log key. So natural log of nine divided by natural log of 1 8th. And that is negative 1.05664. The four would round down, so negative 1.0566. Okay, so that's the change of base. And then we're gonna do some half-life formula stuff, so uh, hang on. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Okay. 
this again is from section 11.7. And this is number 20. The half-life of tritium is 12.4 years. How long will it take for 15% of a sample of tritium to decompose? Round, please round the answer to the nearest tenth. All right, so we're going to use the half-life formula. A equals A sub zero times two to the negative T over H power. We're told that the half-life of tritium or tritium, whatever it is, 12.4 years. How long will it take, so time is the unknown, for 15% to decompose? So we're starting with A sub zero and we're ending with 85% because 15% of the starting amount decomposes, 15% from 100%, 85% is left over, which would be 0.85. So 0 0.85 A sub zero equals A sub zero times two to the negative T over 12.4 years. We're gonna divide both sides by A sub zero. 0.85 equals two to the negative T over 12.4 years. Change it into a logarithmic equation, log base two of 0.85 equals negative T over 12.4. To get T by itself, multiply both sides by negative 12.4. 12.4 is the negatives reduce out, T equals 12.4, I'm gonna use the change of base log of 0.85 divided by log of two. And that's gonna go into the calculator. Negative 12.4 times the log of 0 0.85, close it up, divided by the log of two. And I get 2.907 to the nearest 10th, so it would be the 2.9 right there, okay? Uh, let's see here. Let's take a look at 23. An isotope of lead has a half-life of 8.4 hours. All right, so again, we're gonna use this formula. The half-life is 8.4 hours. How long, so time is the unknown. How long was, how many hours ago was there 30% more of the substance? So now we're going backwards, okay? So the end amount is A. The beginning amount is A, the ending amount, plus, 30% of the ending amount. So A sub zero is 1.3, that is 130% of the ending amount. So we're going backwards in time. We have this much at the end, how long ago was there 30 more percent? Okay, so now our equation becomes A equals 1.3A times two to the negative T over H power. We'll divide both sides by 1.3a. On the right side, we get two. Oh, and I could have put in the value I, for h, I should have written 8.4, negative t over 8.4 power. On the left side, the a is reduced down and I got one over 1.3, which I could leave as a decimal. Um, I'm going to rewrite that as 10 over 13, just making it into a nice fraction, multiplying by 10 over 10. All right. So now I've got log base 2 of 10 thirteenths equals negative t divided by 8.4. We're going to multiply both sides by negative 8.4. So then I get t equals negative 8.4 log of 10 thirteenths divided by log of two. Let's go to the calculator. Negative 8.4 log of 10 thirteenths, close it up, divided by log of two. 
And let's see, which one am I doing here? Number 23, uh, around to one decimal place. I'm getting 3.179, so that'd be 3.2 hours to the nearest tenth of an hour. Okay. All right. That about does it. I'm going to call it quits. So I'm going to stop this. There's no uh, office hour this afternoon. Math 95 students, you have till tomorrow night, 1159 to complete your test. There'll be no class meeting tomorrow either. You just take your test. When I have everything graded and everything, I will email everybody with their final grades. And have a great rest of the day.